good morning and happy Mother's Day. It is a privilege to be addressing you even from this distance. A special greeting to all the mothers and grandmothers who are watching this this morning. Let's pray together. Our Father in Heaven, another week has uh, gone by and we recognize just as much this week as, as the one before it that you have been good and sovereign to us. Uh, there is nothing that has befallen us that has not been father filtered, that has not come down through your fingers uh, to us and therefore we find ourselves grateful for your work in our lives, for your sovereign care for us. And Lord, we uniquely now um, look to you for your help and for your grace as we open your word and seek to make progress in our study of Paul's letter to Titus. Uh, Lord, this is a topic that, that is going to find every one of us right where we live. And I simply pray for the help of your Holy Spirit to help us to, to handle the scriptures well, um, grant that we would make sense of what's here in front of us. Um, by your grace, would we find Jesus to stand forth from this passage, particularly as we think about the, the passages in the, in the weeks ahead that so intimately tie what we're seeing here and what we've seen these last several weeks to the gospel. Uh, so come and make Christ look uh, as the sufficient and beautiful Savior that he is, and feed your people. Uh, nourish us and sustain us so that we are prepared for a week of mission to be and make disciples of Jesus. And we pray this in his mighty and matchless name. Amen. Well, once again, it is my privilege to invite you to open a Bible to Paul's letter to Titus and chapter 2, beginning in verse 9 this morning. New Testament letter of Paul to Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. And I'd like to begin today by thanking all of you who took seriously my request to pray for me as I went to study this past week. Uh, the Lord saw fit to answer your prayers rather speedily and gave me what I like to call the right kind of confidence in, in handling these two verses uh, fairly early on in the week so that I had a really, uh, I think, productive week of study. Um, by, your, by God's grace and through your prayers, it was a rich few days of reflection and thinking and preparation for which I am grateful. And in the interest of getting right down to it, let's simply launch into today's big idea and we'll get started. If there's one truth that you ought to take with you from our passage today, I would, I would want it to be this. As a Christian, you are an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, skillfully disguised within a God-given vocation. I'm not sure who first said it, uh, to whom I should attribute it. I've heard it from Stuart Briscoe, from, from Ron Hutchcraft, his radio ministry, and, and others. It's certainly not original with me, although I've, I've quoted it before. But it's a powerful truth, isn't it? I suspect it's one that you and I don't spend as much time as we ought to pondering. As a Christian, you are an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ skillfully disguised within a one-of-a-kind vocation. In their book, The Gospel at Work, How Working for King Jesus Gives Meaning and Purpose to Our Jobs, uh, the authors Sebastian Traeger and Greg Gilbert write the following. When Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead to redeem a people for himself, he also did so to conform them more and more closely to him by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that he does this through all of the circumstances of our lives, including our jobs. Our jobs are one of the primary ways that God intends to make us more like Jesus. It stands to reason 
I mean, from, from our education and training uh, to the period of time, perhaps 40 years of our career proper, and then of course, clear to the time of retirement, most of us will have devoted thousands upon thousands upon thousands of hours to our vocation from kindergarten all the way to age 65 and perhaps beyond. We shouldn't be inclined to think that Jesus would somehow to elect to put the process of sanctification on hold while we're doing something non-religious like going to school or, or going to work and then resume that project once we're doing our devotions or we're engaged in family worship or enjoying fellowship with our local church. Not only that, but we shouldn't be inclined to think that Jesus would seek to suspend the Great Commission while we're in the class or on the job either, particularly because it's in our careers that take so very many of us out of the church and place us into the culture in the midst of a sea of people who are very far from Jesus. You think he's going to waste that opportunity? Perish the thought. So the sermon this morning is about how work, your work, makes a massive difference in, in the sanctification of your own soul, that you'd become more like Jesus, and that your work makes a massive difference as, as well in the evangelization of those around you so that they might come to meet Jesus. That's the banner that flies over these two verses today, whether it's spoken in these two verses or not. That's the context of this sermon. You may care for a home full of children. You may teach a classroom. You may work in an office situation of some kind or in a cubicle for 40 weeks, 40 hours a week or more, or at least you did prior to COVID-19, right? Many of you these days are gainfully employed and are grateful for it. Others of you are currently unemployed but would love nothing more than to catch on somewhere fast and for you right now your job is to find a job that is your work to find work others of you are in retirement mode or in a different season of life having served uh, many many years on end in the workforce some of us are unable to work and so we depend upon the work of others and some of you still are preparing for your life's vocation because you're students. And if you're a student, whether you're primary school or middle school or high school or college or graduate school, this is your work. Your preparation for your life's work is your work right now. It's a part of your vocation, your calling, your, your divine summons from the author of the universe to use your time and talents and God-given gifts for the common good as well as for the glory and praise of Christ. No matter who you are this morning, if you are a Christian, as a Christian, you are an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, skillfully disguised within a God-given vocation. Therefore, point number one, your work matters in our mission. Your work matters in our mission. In Titus chapter 2 verse 9, the Apostle Paul is once again addressing his trusted apostolic associate Titus. And he is addressing him relative to how he should think about pressing home biblical doctrine into the lives of every person in the body of Christ on the island of Crete. He started with older men, and then older women, and then younger women, and then younger men. And now as we reach verse 9, he has one more group that he'd like for Titus to make sure that he addresses. And this is a group that isn't drawn together by a common age or gender. Rather, this is a group of people that are drawn together in the church by a common vocation that of slave. In Titus 2, two, Titus 2, chapter 9, we read the word bond servants. Bond servants. Now, the Greek word that's underneath this word is the word doulos. And it, it's not 
a difficult word to understand in its original context. Uh, it is, however, a difficult word to know exactly how to translate into English. I find this hysterical that the ESV just seems to be given to fits over the years. It'll switch back and forth between uh, bond servant and slave and servant and so on. Um, the English Standard Version not only has tweaked its rendering of this word in our language over the years and in subsequent editions, but it also has a nice, healthy paragraph at the beginning of probably most of your ESV Bibles, if you have a copy, where they explain why this word is such a challenge, and it ought to give us some sympathy for those who, who translate it. In fact, if you haven't seen it, I want to strongly recommend at some point over the next several days that you check out the video link that is provided inside this week's uh, community group study questions featured in our, our MEFC newsletter that came out on Friday in, the, in your email. Uh, that link, that newsletter uh, with the community group study questions will take you to a seven minute video actually of the translating committee of the English Standard Version and they are hashing out how they ought to uh, understand and translate the word doulos because we simply don't have anything analogous to it in our 20th century Western culture. First century slavery in the Roman Empire, I mean, the sort that Paul was addressing here, looked far more like today's employer-employee relationships than it did, say, African enslavement, uh, say, in the 19th century in this nation, or for that matter, than it does to 21st century global slave trafficking today. When Paul says bond servants, don't, don't think about those sorts of forms of, of wicked enslavement. It's probably most accurate to say that there is simply nothing comparable in the 21st century to what Paul's addressing here in the first century. There's no, there's no modern phenomenon. There's no one-to-one -one correspondence with what captures this. Uh, when we read the word bond servants, whether in Titus chapter 2 or Ephesians chapter 6 verse 5 or Colossians 3.22 or 1 Peter 2.18, we need to be aware that we are, we are unwise to compare this with the, the transatlantic slave trade, for example, from more recent history. Here's why. Uh, New Testament scholar Wayne Grudem writes, the horrible degradation of slaves in 19th century America gives us a far worse connotation, as is accurate, of first century slavery in the Roman Empire. First century slaves were generally well treated, and they were not only unskilled laborers, but managers and overseers and trained members of, of various professions. Slaves would have included doctors, nurses, teachers, musicians, skilled artisans. Nearly one quarter of the entire population of the Roman Empire was at one time in their lives a slave. Grudem continues, furthermore, there was extensive legislation regarding the treatment, regulating the treatment of slaves. They were normally paid for their services and could eventually expect to purchase their freedom. Now, it was involuntary, uh, you were born into it or you found yourself thrown into it because you couldn't pay your debts. But notice that this slavery was not then racially or ethnically motivated. It was economically motivated. So social standing was low and economic independence was not a live possibility while you were a slave. Well, in, in conclusion, Grudem says this, a word stronger than servant and yet weaker than slave is needed. Something meaning semi-impermanent employee without legal or economic freedom. Okay, well, what word is that? There is no word for that that I'm aware of. The closest analogy might be what we have in our modern day employer-employee relationship. So that's where we're going to take the application today. So as a Christian, you are an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, skillfully disguised in a God-given vocation. Therefore, your work matters in our mission. So when you're on the job, I've got five applications for us here. Number one, follow the leader. Follow the leader. As a Christian, you're an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, skillfully disguised in a God-given vocation. Therefore, your work matters in our mission, so when you're on the job, number one, follow the leader. 
In Titus chapter 2, verse 9, we read, Bondservants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. Now, I, I think we can just simply admit it. Let, let's just give way to it. Submission is, as Pastor Aaron said two weeks ago, something of an S-word in our culture. Even in our church culture, in our flesh, we don't like this. Even on the job, we don't like being told what to do. The prospect of taking our lives and arranging them underneath the lives, the purposes and plans of others, especially other sinful human beings, can be at best a challenge, and at worst, crushing and humility-inducing. And yet, isn't that proof positive of the divine design in our vocation? Remember the words of Traeger and Gilbert. Our jobs are one of the primary ways that God intends to make us more like Jesus. Now, yes, he does it through Bible reading. Yes, he does it through prayer and meditation. Yes, he does it through singing and fasting and community group life. Yes, God uses all of these means of grace in our lives in order to conform us to the image of Christ, without a doubt. But he also uses supervisors. He uses bosses. He uses our managers. He uses our team leaders to teach us about submission. Now, verse 9 says, bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. Notice two caveats on the scope of this. First, to their own masters. This is clarifying. In much the same way that he calls wives up in verse 5 to be submissive to their own husbands. It's the same construction in the original. To their own husbands. There, there's a freedom here. So bond servants are to be submissive, not to every master, to their own masters. And the next, next the, the text goes on to say, in everything. I'm never in a hurry to offer footnotes to biblical commands, but in this case, I think we're wise to do so. Uh, here's how old Puritan Matthew Henry put the footnote. Quote, if God's command and the earthly master's command come into competition, we are to obey God rather than men, end quote. Now, that makes good sense, of course. Acts 5.29b says we must obey God rather than men. And so we take it as a given that whatever else we do on the job, we ought never to follow our employer into sin. However, short of that provision, obedience to this instruction is a massive part of what sets Christian employees apart from their colleagues. In fact, what we're going to see is that in these next four applications, they are, in a sense, simply an unfolding of that first one. So, bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything, even when you don't understand, even when you disagree and you do it another way, even when you don't like the way that things are happening. Provided you're not being asked to sin, you are to be submissive to your employer in everything. Now, a quick question here. What if you are the employer or the owner? After all, we've got a number of you in that situation in our congregation. What if it's your business? What if you're the one with the employees? You're, you're the manager, maybe. Maybe you're the team leader. How does a passage like this apply to you? And the simple answer to that question is that according to Colossians 3.23, Jesus is your supervisor. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So bosses, Managers, supervisors, you are serving the Lord Christ. Which is to say that, that each one of these applications then still applies to you. You just simply need to take them all the way up to the management, if you know what I mean. 
As a Christian, you are an ambassador to the Lord Jesus Christ, skillfully, an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, skillfully disguised within a one-of-a-kind vocation. Therefore, your work matters in our mission. So when you're on the job, number one, follow, follow the leader. Secondly, aim to please. Aim to please. In verse 9, we go on to read in our, that our, in our vocations, we ought to be well-pleasing to those whom we work for. And I suppose work among as well. Well-pleasing. Now here's an interesting contrast. Uh, over in Ephesians 6.6, 6, Paul tells first century bond servants that they are to submit to their masters not by way of eye service as people pleasers. Eye service. In Ephesians 6.6, 6, the Apostle Paul, so far as we know, makes up a word. He does this in more than one occasion in the New Testament. He coins a term. You can scour the world of ancient Greek literature, and you will never see this word, I service, anywhere except for in Ephesians 6.6. 6. Don't do your work by way of I service as people pleasers. What's I service? Well, it's the idea of the employee who works hard only when they can be sure that the boss's eye is on them. That's eye service. Paul calls it people pleasing. That's what you're doing when you're rendering eye service. And this is especially fascinating as an instruction for us, given the fact that in, in the best of our circumstances, in the best of circumstances, no boss can be everywhere at once and see everything that you do on the job under their employ. Now, some bosses tend to hover more closely than others. That's, that's true. But no boss sees everything. But how about now? How about when a great number of you are not on the job laboring in an office somewhere or from a cubicle, but you're at home? You're working from home. What if your employer can't see you at all? At least not when you're on a Zoom call. What if your boss can't see anything about your work? Well, this is where we need to be careful. While it may be true for those of you working from home that the eyes of your earthly supervisor aren't on you like they were before, it's also true that if you are a Christian, you have a far greater reality to consider. Proverbs 15.3 says that the eyes of the Lord are are in every place. 1 Peter 3.12 says that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. 2 Chronicles 16.9, that's one of my favorite promises in the entire Bible. 2 Chronicles 16.9 says that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth in order to give strong support to those whose hearts are blameless toward him. On the job, we don't offer eye service as Christians to our employer because frankly, we can't afford to. <laughs> we don't have that option. We don't only work when the boss is watching because there never is a time when the boss isn't watching. Christ sees all. That's why Titus 2.9 actually expects that the work of Christian employees will, in point of fact, be well-pleasing to their earthly employers. We're not people-pleasing. That is, it's, it's not, a, not a vain effort to try and impress our employer. That's not the point here. That doesn't, that's not what Paul's getting at. The point here is that when we work as working for the Lord and not for man, the quality of our labor so far outstrips the expectations of an earthly man or master that it will be well-pleasing to him or her. So notice that Christian vocation isn't about bare submission to our employers, like just meeting the minimum expectations or just barely scraping by. No, a Christian employee follows the leader and he aims to please. And he's not satisfied unless it is pleasing. So follow the leader, aim to please. Third, don't talk back. Don't talk back. Final instruction in verse 9 is, is so 
real. It is, it is so helpful, at least, at least to me. We'll read all of verse 9 together. Uh, Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative. Not argumentative. The word that Paul uses here in verse 9 literally means answering back or, or talking back. Now, now, there are a litany of ways that this happens in the workplace or in a classroom or on a team. Sometimes it looks like contradicting your boss. It can also manifest itself when you subtly seek to undermine his or her authority. It happens when they're not around as well. In this case, it's not so much about talking back, it's about talking to their back. In this case, we need to be careful about slander and gossip or belittling or disparaging someone's reputation, especially a supervisor or a boss. All that junk is a part of this. In fact, um, we can be argumentative in our work without arguing, uh, uttering so much as a single syllable. Now, I'm, I'm not speaking with everyone right now with this example, but perhaps especially our young people, and then we'll apply it to everyone else. Um, I distinctly remember my second grade classroom with Mrs. Sears. One particular time she was giving us an assignment along with some uh, rather laborious instructions that went along with it that I just didn't appreciate. And although I was seven years old at the time, I had developed a rather unenviable way of, of rolling my eyes and pouting when I wasn't getting my way. And so Mrs. Sears is, is giving the homework and, and, uh, and I'm starting to slump down in my seat, fold my arms and roll my eyes in the back of my head and she saw me. She caught me right in the middle of the classroom and she says to me, David, don't do that. <laughs> I'll never forget it. But what was I doing? I was being argumentative. Now, I realize I was seven, but you know, this is still a temptation for adults on the job. Undermining, undercutting, seeking to subvert, even subtly to, to say or to do things that have the effect of blunting our employer's authority in the workplace. It happens, and it is conduct unbecoming a Christian. So follow the leader, aim to please, don't talk back. Fourth, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not steal. Now, I wish we didn't have to say this, but I'm afraid that we do. We need this reminder, otherwise it wouldn't be here in Holy Scripture for us. In verse 10, the inspired apostle goes on to tell us that among all the things that ought not to mark a believer on the job, that a Christian employee is not to be pilfering. Not to be pilfering. Let's, let's read it in context. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering. What's pilfering? We don't, it's not a word we use very often. Well, if you want to see this word, the, the one other time it's featured in the New Testament, you go over to Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, where you see it twice, actually. In Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, we read, But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? Well, there it is. I hope you heard it. We heard it twice. Pilfering. It literally means to keep back for oneself. In other words, this is about misappropriating. This is thieving, it's stealing. Taking from an organization that which does not belong to you. 
Pilfering happens in more ways than you might initially realize. More obvious examples might be cheating on your homework or on an exam if you're a student. Stealing money from the register on the job. Falsifying expense accounts. Stealing inventory. Taking data or records that don't belong to you or aren't meant for your eyes. And if we're not guilty of any of those types of pilfering, then I suspect there is a version of employee theft that we've all been a part of one way or another. And that would be stealing time. Time theft. And I don't just mean punching in and out for someone else or having someone else punch in and out for you, although that would qualify. I'm thinking about things like abusing flexible schedules, like over the last two months come to mind. Using technology for personal use, email, uh, social media during the workday. Taking extended break times, socializing during work hours. You know what that is? It's pilfering, it's stealing, it's time theft. And it's a very, very common sin in our culture. Brothers and sisters of Mount Evangelical Free Church, you want to stand out on the job from your associates, from your classmates, in your vocation? Obey this one. Thou shalt not steal. And you will stand out. Here's the last one. Build solid trust. Build solid trust. Back to verse 10. This particular instruction makes perfect sense lined up to the one that we've just considered. So let's read them together. Verse 10, not pilfering, but showing all good faith. So notice the not but dynamic here. Not this, but this. Not pilfering, not taking, not thieving, not stealing, but showing all good faith. Now the word for faith here is the exact same word that we use for trust, for confidence, for certainty and assurance that in the context of, of this relationship as a member of this workplace or organization or classroom or team that you can be counted on, showing all good faith. It's a summary statement perhaps of what it looks like when a Christian employee is, is clicking on all cylinders. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They're to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering. In other words, they have built a track record of solid trust. And just a reminder that building trust takes time. It takes time. And it can be lost in an instant. Trust is slow to gain and it is swift to lose. In preparation for this message, I read that trust can take years to build, seconds to break, and forever to repair. That's probably not far from the truth. One of the great gifts that your employer can give you is the gift of their trust. Don't abuse it. As a Christian, you are an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, skillfully disguised in a one-of-a-kind vocation. Therefore, your, your work matters in our mission. So when you're on the job, follow the leader. Aim to please. Don't talk back. Thou shalt not steal. And build solid trust. Now that is a tall order, wouldn't you say? And we're going to need assistance to live it out. Thank God that we've got one half of one verse left. It's, it's where all of the help and the hope is hiding. In the back half of verse 10, and especially in verse 11 next week as we move forward. So let's take a look. We'll read the entire text now, verses 9 and 10 together. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Here's the final point today. 
Work done well makes Christ look great. Work done well makes Christ look great. Now I want you to see two things in this text, just in case either hasn't emerged for you in our study of this broader passage over these last several weeks. One of the observations connects verse 10 with verse 1, and then one of the observations connects verse 10 with verse 5. First, notice that in verse 1 and in verse 10, we have very fitting bookends to the entire section. Way back in verse 1, we remember that Paul says to Titus, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And you may recall that the whole point of that verse was to remind us that as we say in the EFCA, that we believe that God's justifying grace must not be separated from his, his sanctifying power and purpose. In other words, when Paul says to Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine, he means teach a way of life that dovetails with your statement of faith. Make sure that the exaltation of Jesus in your heart finds its way out in practical obedience to Jesus with your hands, with older men, older women, younger women, younger men, and now bond servants. Teach what accords with sound doctrine, verse 1. Now compare that with what he says in verse 10. In verse 1, it's teach what accords with sound doctrine. In verse 10, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. In the first case, in verse 1, Paul's concerned with conduct that flows from sound doctrine, with life application for the sake of our local mission to be and make disciples of Jesus. In the second case, here in verse 10, Paul's laboring to explain to Titus that when we take care that our Christian convictions are accompanied with Christian character, we make Christ look spectacular. We don't just live in accord with sound doctrine. We adorn Christian doctrine. In verse 10, the word underneath our English word adorn is the Greek word kosmosin. Kosmosin. We get our word cosmetics from this word. Now, typically, when we think of applying cosmetics, whether through makeup or maybe plastic surgery, we do so because we're trying to make a situation that's less than appealing actually begin to look attractive. Well, here in verse 10, what we've got is already something that is absolutely breathtakingly beautiful, namely Jesus. Jesus and his gospel, his life and death and resurrection and ascension and, and soon return for us. So is Paul telling us that the gospel somehow needs our cosmetic help? Like putting lipstick on a pig, perhaps? Not quite. The words of John Stott are helpful here as he comments. The verb cosmeo was used of arranging jewels in order to display their beauty. And the gospel is a jewel. While the Christian life is like the setting in which the gospel jewel is displayed, it can add luster to it. Oh, that's good. I hope that moves you as you think about your work. The gospel cannot be improved upon, of course. It is a perfectly priceless jewel just as it is apart from our vocations. However, stone setting matters. It matters. The way that we display and seek to show forth this priceless, precious jewel makes a difference. And Paul's point is that when our Christian character catches up with our Christian convictions, we display the Spirit's labor in our lives and we make the gospel look beautiful. And we make Jesus look, as he is, irresistible. So that's the first observation. Work well done makes Christ look great. Now here's the second part of that observation. It connects verse 10 with verse 5. 
Back in verse 5, Paul tells Titus that older women ought to do their, their work, their mentoring of younger women in such a way that the word of God may not be reviled. Remember that? It's a, it's a sub substantive foundation as well as the motivation for what we often refer to as Titus II ministries within the local church. Older women discipling younger women. And don't miss it. So that the word of God may not be reviled. That God's word may not be disparaged or scorned or made light of. It's a huge statement about the value of mentoring ministries, about the value of, of women's mentoring ministries in the context of the local church especially. That the word of God may not be reviled. It brings an incredible amount of dignity and honor to this work. Now, contrast that with what we read in verse 5 with what we read in verse 10. Because in verse 10, we see that work well done makes Christ look great, so that in everything we adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Here's the point, and it's a very sobering one. In our Christian lives, in our vocations, as the Lord has designed them, there is no middle ground. You see this? In your work, you either revile the word of God or you adorn the doctrine of God. But it's one or the other. Your work displays Christ's beauty or it tarnishes his reputation. Here's how Alexander McLaren put it. The issues of the conduct of professing Christians are one or the other of these two. They either add beauty to the gospel or they cause the word of God to be blasphemed. And he says to his church in Manchester, England, some 150 years ago, your lives, professing Christians, are not neutral in their effect upon men's estimate of your creed. Now, there's a lot on the line here, and that's why I so praise God for verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared. The grace of God for our pardon when we get it wrong on the job. And the grace of God to empower us so that we can get it right on the job. For the glory that Christ deserves more on that next week. As a Christian, you are an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, skillfully disguised within a one-of-a-kind vocation. Therefore, your work matters in our mission. So when you're on the job, follow the leader. Aim to please. Don't talk back. Thou shalt not steal and build solid trust. Because work well done makes Christ look great. Now next week, Lord willing, we ought to be real familiar with that language these days. All of life has always been Lord willing, but I, I hope that we're learning that language even more in the middle of this season. Next week, Lord willing, we will begin our study of the final paragraph of chapter 2. Five verses over these next three weeks, and for me anyway, this particular portion of Paul's letter to Titus is a high point, if not the high point. These next five verses are saturated to the point of dripping with the person and work of Jesus, with, uh, with the functional centrality of the gospel, with the soon return of our Lord Jesus, with a celebration of the anticipation of his second coming, and also with the priority of good works in the life of the local church. These verses are relevant, friends. They are relevant for our mission. They are relevant for our 2025 vision. And I cannot wait to get to work this week. I hope the same is true of you. We have much to anticipate in the days ahead. But right now, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your your gift of sustaining us. You know, we asked you at the beginning of this message that you would provide the gift of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And I just, I sensed his empowering over these moments. 
You care about us. You care about us um, scattered as we are in our homes. It's so wrong that we're not gathered. There's, there's something broken here. Lord God, I pray that you would help us to, um, to thread the needle of, of obeying our government on the one hand and obeying your call to gather on the other. Until the time when we gather again, Lord, would you, would you be with us as we seek to apply passages like these to our lives. We look forward to thinking about the study questions and other things that might apply in our community groups and in our own families and in our walk together with brothers and sisters in this local church. Lord, continue to um, edify this body so that we are built up in turn, Lord, so that we are filled in order to pour, to pour out to the lives of men and women and boys and girls in the West Honka area and beyond. Use us, Lord, not just for the purposes of church health, but for the purposes of church growth. There are so many people who do not have a savior during this season, and we want to be used as a means of your grace to make that happen. So use us on the job this week for your glory, for our good, and for the ingathering and the upbuilding of your church. In Jesus' name, amen.